Well, here's a little flashback for you. I'm from the International Medical University. Got to go back in time into the first course I did on registered wellness consultant, the fossil lap procedure. See, we're going to go through a whole idea of, of the flow of digestion with the mnemonic tool of fossil lap so that you can understand the anatomy of your digestion. Many people say that we are what we eat. More than that, we are, because that is true, we are what we eat. But more than that, we also have to realize that we are what we absorb. We want to talk about absorbing. We want to talk about the entire nutritional chain so that we can find out different insights about our, our absorption of nutrients. Now, I've made a memory tool called Fossil Lap. If you can imagine a fossil on your lap, and imagine this as a word, and each of these is a distinct layer of our nutritional chain. Now the first one is the foods. The foods that we eat. And this is very important because we must realize that nature has supplied us with the perfect types of food. The synthetic chemical companies have not been able to supply food. In fact, many of their synthetic fats and diff different compounds have created cancers and created diseases. We know that we want natural foods. We want fresh and raw natural foods. Juicing is excellent to help liberate some of the nutrients because sometimes our digestive channels are weak and we have a hard time separ separating those nutrients. The mouth is actually a small juicer because that is the next step, oral. The mouth is meant to juice and start preparing the foods for digestion. In the first step of foods, we need to address fresh and raw. As we need fresh and raw fruits and vegetables, very important, and this needs to be a large part of our diet, a minimum of 20% of our diet, and at least 40% for good natural health. The sicker you are, the more you need fresh and raw fruits and vegetables. Now these might irritate you. That is because your digestive channel might be weak. The digestive channel is actually a series of different hormones and muscles and etc. And if it is weak, you might not be able to tolerate the fresh and raw fruits and vegetables. If this is the case, you need to take small, small amounts and gradually increase. But the first step is fresh and raw fruits and vegetables. Well, I haven't seen Bill for a while, but food is your best medicine, as Henry Byer has told us over and over again. And see, we have to get nutrient-rich foods to eat for nutrients, for nutrition, not just for stimulation. You see, we found that, there's, that good diet can help prevent many different diseases and that it's learning how to eat for nutrition, not stimulation, foods that raise your vibration, cancer-fighting spices, how to put these things into our foods and into our, our world and diet. Learning the nutrient-dense foods. We have a whole book on this. Learning what not to eat. It's very important to learn what not to eat. You don't eat old shoes. We also don't eat the hot dogs and all that crazy sugar crap. You have to learn what to eat. You have to learn nutrient-dense foods and to get the good qualities and learning the good things to eat. And we put this all together in several different books so that you could start to understand the idea. From this little tape, you might not be able to get this, but get the book from the link, and the link will teach you more and more how to learn to help yourself. Here's the Quantum Home Nutrition book. The idea of the energy that passes into the brain that links to digestion. The next step is the oral. Like I've said before, the mouth is needed to start the digestive process as we start blending in certain carbohydrate, or known as amylase enzymes. These are brought in through the saliva. The saliva is also meant to be a lubricant. If your mouth is constantly dry, that might be an indication that the very start of your digestive process is in, inadequate. If the teeth are not being able to do their job, if you have problems with the dentition, this is another cause of progressive disease, as we will not be getting the rest of our quality digestion. Also, if we are not chewing our foods properly, the more and more unnatural the food, the more synthetic the food, the more food additives, the worse it will taste in the mouth.
Whereas natural foods, the longer it stays in the mouth, the better it will, it will have in flavor. As food sits in the mouth, it will increase as the sugars are being let free. Whereas if we have many food additives, etc., whiteners, bleachers, etc., these things will be liberated and the food will taste worse. So we, we start to see a fast food generation of all different types of things. We see the fast food companies, they don't put in comfortable seats. They want you to eat quickly, eat fast. The faster you eat, the better their junk food will taste. This is wrong. We want to try to savor our flavor and let the mouth do its job and take time to generate. Let the juice, the natural juicer of the mouth, juice the food by chewing, chewing, chewing. This is important and we should take a minimum of 23 chews on everything that we eat. This is a minimum. Sometimes with some of my very, very sick people, we take things like broccoli, especially the cancer patients, and tell them to chew it like gum. Just chew it a hundred times so we make sure we liberate all the nutrients and that the natural juicer of the mouth can do its job. Yes, that natural juicer in our teeth, and this is why the mouth is close to the brain in all of God's animals, so that it sets up digestion. You see, as we start to masticate the foods, into the food comes saliva and enzymes called petalin, which are carbohydrate digestive. And all the little teeth are meant to be a juicer and prepare food for the next step of digestion. Then we have all the little different parts of the sublingual glands and the salivary glands, all combined along with the adenoids and the tonsils, which help to catch viruses and allergies and filter them out. The TMJ disturbances, all of this we have to learn about what happens in our natural juicer of the mouth. This is all taught in depth inside the book. We're giving you a little preview here, but you can learn more and more about the natural process of our digestion and how it starts with that natural juicer in the mouth. The next step in our fossil lab process is the stomach. This is a very essential part and so much abused part of our nutritional system, of our nutritional absorptive system. The stomach now will drop in large amounts of hydrochloric acid. This is not an enzyme. This hydrochloric acid will come into the system. The hydrochloric acid will come into the stomach. It is not an enzyme. It is meant to help prepare the food for the next step in digestion. There is a small amount of enzymes that are put into the stomach that will assist. Also, the stomach will be mixing in mucus as it tries to protect itself from the stomach acid. There are intrinsic factors and many other things happening inside the stomach. The stomach will now process this and needs to hold it while the acid mixture does its job and slowly the acid mixture will become more alkaline. The job of the stomach is to hold this for at least an hour with, with different foods and the more concentrated the fats, concentrated the proteins, the longer time it will take, maybe up to even three hours, as the food will be slowly processed in the stomach, preparing for the next step of digestion. If we were to take too much liquid, we can dilute the stomach acid, thereby accelerating the process, making the, uh, the stomach open prematurely, allowing the mixture to move. If we take antacids, we could do this. Take too much fluids. If we eat too much, there's lots of different things that happen. This stops the stomach from working. The stomach wants to do its job and we create a tension. When the stomach opens at the pyloric valve to let the food into the small intestine, there also is a, a release of a hormone that has anti-depression effects. So getting the stomach to release not only relieves the, the tension, but also produces an antidepressant. But the food that escapes now to the small intestine is not properly prepared. This will uh, allow the formation of large undigested fats, large undigested fats, large undigested proteins, and the large undigested fats and large undigested proteins will now 
not be properly prepared for the small intestine. It will burden the small intestine, produce problems for our nutrition, and create a host of different problems. We will now not have proper fats in our bloodstream, not have proper proteins or amino acids in our bloodstream, as our amino acid and fatty acid pools in our bloodstream will be a problem. As this is a problem, it will create more of a tension and we will start to see many of the accelerative degenerative diseases start when we are children and we don't follow the rules of the stomach. The rules of the stomach meaning allowing the stomach to do its work, relaxing after a meal for 45 minutes so that the stomach can be able to process its food, minimizing the amount of liquid, not taking antacids, not taking coffee, not taking milk with a meal, all these different things which are covered in the rules of the stomach. There are many texts along with all these uh, different movies on this CD to help you to understand more fully what we are trying to say. But allow the rules of the stomach to come into your life. You will see that the, many of the, beautiful, the quote, beautiful people in the world are people who follow the rules of the stomach. And you should too. The rules of the stomach, so important there, Bill. Well, thank you. This is Desiree Dubonet. Here we have the stomach. And we have to realize that the stomach is so key in digestion as it really starts to tear things apart, get things ready. Inside the book, we tell you so much more about the rules of the stomach and just what to do and what not to do. And so many people disobey these rules. They take antacids to weaken the the, the acid-alkaline environment, they drink too much. You know, you have to understand that your stomach empty is the size of your fist and your stomach full is the size of your head. If you stretch the stomach too much, you'll create problems. You have to understand about the cardiac sphincter at the top and the pyloric sphincter at the bottom and how it has to reach a certain pH before the food is allowed to move on. So if we upset the pH balance in the stomach with too much drink, or with antacids, we are disturbing the digestive process tremendously. We then get into a undigested fats, undigested protein, and this creates problems. This creates all different types of problems. Here we see where uh, gastric ulcers can start, as a little tear in parts of the stomach can prevent the ability of the stomach to protect itself, and this creates ulcers. We have to learn how to handle this. Next in our series is the small intestine. Here's where most of our absorption will take place. We will see now in the small intestine a release of a sodium bicarb which needs to neutralize the acid. If we take coffee with a meal, that will cause the, the small intestine to release its sodium bicarb from the pancreas prematurely. It will then have to do it again at the end of the meal. This is why taking coffee with the meals is the number one form, the number one cause of pancreatic cancer. Because we're asking the pancreas to release its sodium bicarb too fast, it should take five to six hours to recover, and we're asking it to do it within an hour. This creates a problem, not only for our digestion, but a problem for the pancreas. The small intestine now blends in the bile which also helps to neutralize the acid, blends in the sodium bicarb, and a host of pancreatic enzymes are now going to escape into our small intestine to help facilitate our digestion. The digestive process in the small intestine will be an electrical process, as there are electrical brush border effects of the fiber in our diet, which will create a little electrical tension to help nutrients to come into the small intestine the different enzymes, etc. The small intestine is a fantastic chemical absorptive plant where we are now going to be able to break things into our nutrition. We need fiber, we need nutrients, and we need natural. We need the stomach to do its job for the small intestine to properly do its job. Now, throughout our body, we take a look at different organs like the heart, and we know the relative size. And if the heart starts getting too big, we know that's a cause of disease. We know that that's a problem. If we see that the liver is swelling, we say that's, that's disease. If we see the spleen is swelling, that's disease. So we can see these different diseases. But when the small intestine swells, we don't think about it that way. 
Why? Because most people don't obey the rules of the stomach. They don't obey the rules of the small intestine. Thereby, their small intestines increase. From the width of the, of the ascending colon to the descending colon, the width of our patient should be no more than two of their palms, two of their fingers. If that is the case, and they have this, then that is the normal size of the small intestine. In fact, a little bit smaller than that, actually one palm with three fingers would be the ideal size of the small intestine. But in many of our patients, we're going to see sometimes it's three or four palms and it has become excessive. The small intestine has swollen in size. It has distended. It has been pushed by breaking of the rules of the stomach creating a burden on the small intestine. It has to swell in order to do the job of the stomach and the small intestine. We're going to create more and more of a problem. Most of the problem with obesity in America today is not just fat, but it is distension of the small intestines. However, fat is very important. But we're going to have to work with the small intestine and, and understand the small intestine and find ways that we can take the cure and get back to our natural health. Taking the cure, very important. You have to read the book about the little things that happen inside the intestine that create these type of little holes, you see, because this is what the key spot where most of our nutrients are going to be absorbed, our vitamins and different things, all of our fats, etc. We see that the different length, the human digestive system is completely different, the herbivore versus the carnivore. In humans, we are in the middle, the omnivore. We can't just live completely on meat. But here in the intestine, these factors are absorbed into the small little villi that we see here, which have a dramatic increased surface area. And these things absorb. And if we have not prepared our digestion, the undigested fats, undigested proteins, this, the large undigested fats, large undigested proteins, the love pup can be a problem. Here we can see that the normal uh, small intestine should have a certain size. If it gets too big and we get the big gut, that's because the intestine has swollen in size. When the heart swells in size, it's a problem. When the intestine swells in size, it's just as big a problem. We have to be able to try to keep the intestine health good by obeying the rules of the stomach and recognizing everything that happens before it gets there is important. Crohn's disease happens when a fungus gets into the different intestinal wall and creates this type of a problem that upsets digestion. This creates a big problem in an imbalance of our complete nutrition. We have to be able to deal and learn more through the books about the digestion. Next we have the ileocecal valve. This is a valve between the small intestine and the large intestine where food now is going to be able to pass from the small intestine into the large intestine. This ileocecal valve should be a one-way valve to prevent the bacteria of the large intestine from coming back into the small intestine. The ileocecal valve can be found if you place your thumb into your belly button and your little finger onto the iliac crest, where these three fingers come down in the middle is going to be the ileocecal valve. This is also very close to McBurney's point and the uh, place where the appendix is. Oftentimes we have intestinal pain at this spot because the ileocecal valve might be stuck closed or open. Foods like popcorn, sometimes strawberries, but foods that have tiny little things in them, or husks, etc. Sometimes these husks can get caught into the ileocecal valve and create problems. One of the ways to adjust the ileocecal valve is to place the fingers into this area briskly and massage upwards towards the left shoulder. And by doing this 10 times where there is pain, that can help the ileocecal valve to get the message to help stabilize. If it's open or closed, it can help to, to regulate it back to where it should be. This is known as the ileocecal valve massage. This is a very important point because if the ileocecal valve is stuck closed or stuck open, we can have a host of different problems that are going to be generated as we are not going to be properly absorbing our nutrients. Yes, that ileocecal valve right there in between the belly button and the hip crest, 
It's called McBurney's point in medicine. You see, and that can create a problem. It also can be a sign of appendicitis. It's right there next to it. But when we have a blockage in the ileocecal valve, a slight little massage can help to free that up. It's very important to learn about all these things and to recognize. Here we have the greater omentum. This is the fat area. There's one on the inside and there's one on the outside. And this helps to protect as well as provide a base of nutrition if there's ever a fasting situation. Next now we can talk about the large intestine. Now for the first time, we're going to need help. We need bacteria, we need fungus, we need viruses. We have a host of microorganisms that are going to infest the large intestine. The baby is born with a sterile large int intestine and the colostrum or the release of the, of the mother's milk the first couple of days will have a type of bacteria that will help populate this. This is very important as we're going to now start the process of getting the digestive system, getting the proper bacteria into the bowel. We need these bacteria to help break up different nutrients, absorb different nutrients. We need these bacteria to help us absorb uh, and synthesize many different vitamins in a natural way. And there's going to be literally hundreds of different types of microflora. This incredibly complex system is dominated by the number one bacteria known as bacterioides. Bacterioides will account for 60 to 70 percent of the weight of your stool. This is an anaerobic bacteria, meaning it's a nasty bad bacteria, and it belongs in the bowel. If it escapes out of the bowel through some type of hose, what we call leaky gut syndrome in the large intestine, this type of bacteria can then get into create hemorrhoids. It can go to different areas and create varicose veins because it likes to get into venous or vein tissue. It's a nasty little bacteria, but it's absolutely needed for digestion. In addition to that, now we also have the lactobacilli of acidophilus, bifidus, bulgaris, and salvarius, and many of these other types of bacteria, which are then there also. These are aerobic bacteria, and they are good bacteria that will help us in digestion. We also need E. coli, a bad bacteria, strep, staph, a host of other types of bacteria, hundreds of different types that will populate our large intestine and be part of the natural process. Bacteria are not our enemies. They are part of God's plan and we need them for existence. The germ theory was incorrect. The large intestine is needed and we need this natural. We now know that the natural best food for baby is mother's milk, that the synthetic uh, supplements are not the best. We know that the large intestine and natural uh, quantities are what we need. Now that the system has been able to uh, break it up, we've got most of our digestion of the small intestine, the large intestine is going to help us with water-soluble vitamins and help us to stabilize water. We've manufactured a lot of fluids in the stomach, fluids in the small intestine, where now the large intestine is going to try to reabsorb those fluids back into our system. If it doesn't, we might get into a watery release. On the other side of the large intestine, opposite the ileocecal valve, we find the valve of Houston. The valve of Houston we can find by placing our left thumb into the umbilicus, left little finger on top of the iliac crest and where these three fingers come down, we have another valve. If this valve stays open, the large intestine does not get a chance to absorb its water and the different liquids out of the, out of the stool and we will get diarrhea. If we have too much diarrhea, we would be depleting the water, getting dehydrated, as well as the different minerals because the large intestine also now will not only absorb the water but absorb these minerals back into the system. Minerals which will go into the bloodstream and be able to help us. So the large intestine is very, very important and on doing, and if we have pain in the valve of Houston, sticking our fingers in and massaging towards the right so shoulder ten times can help to stabilize this and has cured many types of diarrhea that I've seen with different types of patients because the valve of Houston might simply be stuck open. If it's stuck closed, we might have a place where the bowel is going to create a distension. We get irritable bowel symptoms where, because it might be a problem with the 
simply the valve of Houston. So the large intestine is critically important. Different allergy foods will complicate the valve of Houston as it will have a tendency to clench if there's a allergy food. So the large intestine now, we blend in the bacteria to help us. The symptom of a problem with the large intestine is going to be too much rectal gas because that means that there's a problem in the bowel flora, an upset. But this is extremely important in our digestive system. Yes, like we're saying, now let's go through the intestine here. And we can see that as food goes through, it starts to sweep through here. That creates a brush border effect that can help to stimulate the nutrition absorption. So in the small and large intestine, we can see that it's very important that we keep this clean and we have fiber in our meals, natural good fruits and vegetables that help to sweep all these little things out. And what we are is a big tube that goes from the mouth all the way down to the anus. Now we're into the large intestine now, you see. And this tube has sphincters in it. This first sphincter is the mouth and different sphincters in the stomach, pyloric, cardiac sphincter, you see. Then we get down into the ileocecal valve, the valve of Houston, and then finally down to the anus and the sigmoid coil. And all these little sphincters that help to block and hold things for the right moment to open up. And this is all a process as we go through the intestine. We have to recognize that it's very important for us to get good probiotics and not to kill the bacteria in the, in the large intestine. There should be a very good bacteria to make our vitamins and all different types of other things. Here we see some of the diseases of the colon and how they strike. We have to learn about these type of things in the diverticuli. What Crohn's disease can and might not do. It's usually a type of fungus or infection state. And just where all these other little things happen that create problems for us and inflammatory bowel disease, when inflammation comes in and how we can treat this and recognize it, how we can work with the human body to prevent these different things by learning more about the fossil lab procedure and learning more how to help our patients and how to get them into good colon health. It's not easy, it can't be done in a couple of weeks, but gently, gently with the right foods and good exercise, we can help restore colon health. Next we have the liver. The liver is extremely important. As the nutrition that comes out of the small intestine, the large intestine, will now go through the liver, cross through the portal system into the liver for the liver to detoxify. The liver is meant to take a look at all of the different factors of our nutrition and to, if there's a toxin, be able to manufacture a chemical cap and neutralize the toxin through a process known as conjunction. The liver is a chemical plant where it manufactures chemicals to detoxify items. It has to do this within seconds as it looks at the passage of the food. The liver is extremely essential and it's the, the seat of life, liver, life. It's the seat of detoxification. It's very, very important. Certain times, large toxins, large undigested fats, large undigested proteins, or large toxins in our system can get into the large intestine, small intestine, into the lymphatic system, sometimes crossing the border inappropriately, and thereby not getting a chance of the liver to detoxify. So there again, if we disobey the rules of the stomach, we can create a problem where large undigested fats, large undigested proteins can be escape around the detoxification of the liver and get into the system to create problems and diseases in many other places. But the liver is so important that we can say that if you are sick, the liver is involved. Because in every sickness, the liver in its ability to create anti-inflammatories, create stable factors, detoxification factors, assist the immune system, assist many other different types of things. The liver's involved in every disease. And taking good care of the liver by not drinking to excess, staying away from toxic drugs, staying away from uh, all the other t different excess toxins in our environment, these are things that we need to do for our liver, as well as take good liver herbs, liver juices, and help to cleanse our liver, and oftentimes once or twice a year doing a liver flush. 
Yes, a good liver flush can help. Here we see the liver. It's very important. And it can rebuild itself. It does so many things. And the gallbladder and what it does as it holds these emulsifications. If you get into the books, you're going to see real good, definite idea of just all the functions that the liver does and how it provides a type of bile that will emulsify fats into the small intestine, making an electrical absorption. And that the bile comes in as an emulsifier to make a Michel balance inside the intestine. And it's because of the electrical Michel balance that absorption happens. Absorption is an electrical process. And we want to get into the idea of stool analysis and watch the movies on stool analysis because the stools should be able to float, not be stinky or sti sticky or stinky and have all the different things, and we're gonna learn this in our books. Next, the autonomic nervous system. There's two p basic parts of our central nervous system. When we have the motor and sensory, which we are using to move and to sense things, but there's another called the autonomic nervous system. This is an automatic system that's working through the body to automatically regulate my reaction to heat, automatically regulating my digestion, automatically regulating the, the pupil distension, automatically regulating all the factors of my body. Inside the autonomic nervous system, we have two halves. One is the sympathetic or active nervous system keyed by adrenaline. This is known as our fight or flight system. As we get into how do we handle stress? If a black panther comes into the room, what do I do? How do I react? Do I run? Do I fight? What do I do? That type of stress will produce a dilation in the pupils, a rising of the hair in my back, an increase in the heart flow, a decrease in my digestion. The other half of the autonomic nervous system is known as the parasympathetic. And the parasympathetic has as its key hormone acetylcholine. And it is more of our passive or relaxing system of nerves. This is responsible for our digestive. Our digestive system is fired by the parasympathetic. Our immunity system, our ability to handle uh, exposure to bacteria, fungus, viruses. Our immunity is the parasympathetic system. The sympathetic system or stress and the parasympathetic system are balanced in the body, in the healthy body. In the unhealthy body, we get an imbalance, either too much parasympathetic or as in 80% of the diseases in America, North America, in the world today, we see an imbalance of the sympathetic nervous system where there's too much stress, too much sympathetic nerves, too much of a blockage of nutrition, too much of a blockage of immunity, and creating a problem of this, too much stress. So we have a problem that we need to work with. In working with all disease, the key of knowing disease is knowing the autonomic nervous system. This is so vitally important. And I'm just giving you the smallest amount of this. There is more in our books and more in the literature and more on the RWC course, which we offer, which teaches you more about these things. But understanding the abilities of the body, how it reacts between sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves, is the key part of really knowing about the body, knowing how to relax and when to relax. It is so important that we give ourselves 30 minutes of relaxation after every meal so that we can allow the digestive process to work to its best advantage. This is very important. We need to know that we need to have a good sympathetic system, but we also need to know how to develop a good parasympathetic system and how to balance ourselves. And this is a key factor in our health care. We have to learn about adrenal fatigue. We have to learn about all the different things that make up the balance of our central nervous system and the balance of our peripheral nervous system between the autonomic system and all these other different types of nerves. As we start to understand more about the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, we learn more about the digestive process that happens best when we relax and get into parasympathetic dominance. 
Stress can block digestion and thereby create all kinds of problems. We have to get to the electrical balance. This is where the skio helps to provide an electrical stimulation and charge the batteries of the cells, helping the lymphatics to drain more, helping the whole body to be able to understand and heal itself better. Very important. Last on our list of the fossil lab is the pancreas. The pancreas is so key. We've talked about its effect in the small intestine. But its ability to not only dis dispense enzymes, enzymes into our digestion, but enzymes which will later escape into our bloodstream and help us in many other ways. So the pancreatic enzymes are paramount in our health, paramount in helping all the different processes of our body to operate effectively. Also, the pancreas has its ability to control blood sugar. The sensoring areas are more into the brain, pituitary, uh, medulla oblongata, which will sense as we drop in blood sugar, communicating to the pancreas to be able to release insulin. Insulin to be able to help convert food that we have just eaten, or the pancreas might even be able to help us break up fat tissues to get us blood sugar and increase this. So the pancreas and its ability to control blood sugar through insulin is also paramount in our understanding of this. So we, we have to put the pancreas down here as something we need to learn how to deal with. Now in summary, we want to know about foods, fresh and raw. Are we getting the fresh and raw? How much of our diet is fresh and raw? Do we have dryness in the mouth? Is there excess dryness in the mouth? Do we have clicking in the jaw? Do we properly chew our food? The stomach problems will create belching and bloating after meals and a craving of liquids. Do we have belching and bloating after meals or craving of liquids? This will tell us that there's a stomach concern. Small intestine will create a problem where we will see stools that are oily, light in color, float, smelly. These different types of things can help tell us that there's a problem in the small intestine. If we have cuts or bruises that don't, that don't heal properly, it also tells us. Ileocecal valve, do we have pain in the lower right quadrant if, down in this area? Do we often have some little twinges? This can help tell us there's a problem in the ileocecal valve. The large intestine, rectal gas, can help to tell us. The liver and the pancreas, any disease that you have is involving the liver and the pancreas. And the autonomic nervous system, are you able to balance the stress versus relaxation in your life? These are the different hallmarks that allow us to intuit into a person how do we increase their ability to absorb nutrients. It is not just what you eat. It is what you absorb. See, we have the pancreas here. And without these pancreatic enzymes, see, 99% of what the pancreas does is enzymatic, and 1% of what the pancreas does is imbalancing sugar. But the pancreas is so sensitive. We have the exocrine function and the endocrine function of the pancreas. And all of these things are very, very important that we help to understand our pancreatic function. Here's a nice pancreas cleanse juice that can be made very simply, very easily. Should use this a couple times a month, not every day. We learn about weight loss in the Quantum Weight Loss book. We can learn about juicing. If our juicer, our oral problems, we can help to juice them. We have to learn about sugar, diabetes. These are all the books that I've been giving you. The idea of anatomy, and physiology book that I've made. We have all of these different books. Here's a book on the pathways of human pathology. Very interesting. We have to learn about all these things. What diabetes is and how it affects us and why it creates a problem with our sugar balance and how taking in too much sugar can create that. As we start to understand more about our digestive system, we recognize that we are what we eat, but we're also much more what we absorb. And as we learn more and more about these things, we come to understand our bodies understand the hormones, understand ourselves, understand our heart and the magnetic action of what we are. So in this little movie here, I've tried to help tantalize and inform you a little bit of just what you need to know in order to become a registered wellness consultant. 
This is Desiree Dubonnet, and I hope you get into the books and into the rest of the movies and learn more and more.